Hello, and welcome to, More Intelligent Tomorrow, a wide-ranging exploration of the potential impact of AI on the world around us, as envisioned by the future heroes of the human and machine intelligence revolution. Will AI become the healthcare industry's prescription? We'll discuss this and more with Julia Polk and Chase Spurlock on today's episode. And now, your host, Ari Kaplan. Well, hi, everyone. Uh, We're very pleased to have Chase Spurlock and Julia Polk, the CEO and Chief Strategy Officer at Decode Health. Uh, Decode leverages AI and identifies and manages disease risk, really especially around uh, costly chronic diseases and the uh, current COVID outbreak. So welcome, Chase and Julia. Thank you. Nice to be here with you, Ari. So Chase, you have a really interesting and varied background. Uh, founded Decode a year ago, uh, prior with IQity, um, and also I see on LinkedIn you have 19 publications. You know, really in depth things that are hard to pronounce, but uh, you know, very impressive and hands-on. So you know, what, what was your background in these publications? Yeah, my background is in immunology, healthcare data, and data science applied to a variety of different conditions. Uh, ranging from you know chronic disease, as you mentioned, to the to the current COVID pandemic, and um, this is um, our second company focused on the use of machine learning uh, to solve disease problems. And Acuity was the first um, where we were trying to make sense of a lot of data, um, a lot of blood data, to be able to help produce clinically useful information for doctors to diagnose at the time autoimmune diseases like MS faster. Um, people that are on the path to an MS diagnosis are on a diagnostic odyssey that can last up to five to seven years. Misdiagnosis is also common. So at the time, you know, we were focused on um, building blood tests that could allow us to be able to pinpoint disease faster and more accurately. And then over time, um, we began looking at other healthcare data sets, EHR extracts, claims data sources, and other um, just widely used uh, population level data sets and found that we could build personas of patients that are on different legs of the chronic disease journey, uh, patients that are heading towards a diagnosis, patients that are misdiagnosed, patients that had uncontrolled disease, and we could help healthcare become more proactive. And that's really what we want to be able to do with Decode. We actually were incubating Decode inside Acuity for a number of years before deciding to ultimately spin it out. And collectively, you know, we have over a decade of experience in this in this world. And it's all about helping us helping us understand the persona of a patient who has that bad bad outcome so that we can deliver care proactively to mitigate that risk and to and to try to get on top of of these uh, warning signs sooner so that we can stave off progression of disease but um, things like hospitalizations that you know not only lead to costs but are also signs of disease that's been poorly maintained. Speaking of Launch Tennessee, um, I no, Julia, you are involved in that and have also been a serial entrepreneur. So tell us about uh, your background. Well, it has been a long journey, but when I think back to all the things that I've been doing since I returned to Nashville um, in the 80s, I came back from being on Wall Street for a couple of years in, at Morgan Stanley. And interestingly, one of the most the most fascinating projects I worked on was for the first ever AIDS test. And this was in the 80s when only the the medical community was talking about AIDS. But came back to Nashville, got involved in the venture community here, and over time was dropped in on occasion to a number of early stage companies. So that was my first introduction to switching sides of the table and leaving the investor side and the investment banking side to become part of a team. And that began a long career of doing exactly that kind of work. And it has been the joy of my life to be involved in so many early stage companies. Yeah, great, great thoughts. And I know in the past, it's sometimes hard to attract people from the coasts, uh, you know, to come to a Tennessee. But, you know, with the unfortunate, you know, COVID and, uh, you know, just the traditional cost of living in San Francisco and Seattle, um, you know, now the unfortunate fires do you see uh, like any uptick of, you know, making it even more desirable to live in, you know, the family friendly uh, Tennessee? 
Well, one of the things about the state that is true is that we don't have a state income tax. So we, it is a wonderful place to transition. And if you spent $2, $2 million on a, on a very small spot in San Francisco, you can buy a very large house here. But one of the things we talk about with entrepreneurs is your money goes a long way in the state of Tennessee. So if you're going to build a company here and hire the talent here, your, your ability to scale that business just from a cost of living point of view is so much improved over many of the larger cities. Um, for a while, we had more of a talent challenge, but I just don't feel like we're having that anymore. And we're bringing insights from, you know, scaling large technology companies into this part of the country. And that's going to be, that's going to benefit everybody. One thought, and then we'll bring it a little back to uh, decode, but you had mentioned you worked on the, the AIDS um, uh, uh, you know, back in the eighties, um, how, first of all, how long did it take to get the, you know, the cocktail or the treatment for that to be developed? And then do you see any parallels with uh, COVID? So the company that we financed at Morgan Stanley, it was a very strange transaction because they typically didn't do the kind of private placements that you see done everywhere else. They do such large transactions. This was a scientist who had created a test for AIDS. And so um, he would stand up in front of these largely male um, sales forces across uh, New York and describe what AIDS was and how you got it. Now, this was 1984. So really, you didn't hear about it except in the medical community. I actually have many of uh, my family members are surgeons. So you were st I was hearing about it from them and the worry that they were starting to try to understand the disease. So this was super early days. And I remember him standing up in front of them and saying, we're going to have, we're going to have a cure in 10 years. And obviously that hasn't happened. So the interest in trying to solve, you know, to have, to, to have that be one of my first projects. And now when we started Acuity, we were really in the diagnostic business. When you think about how to, how to address this infectious disease and the importance of good testing. And, and Chase and I spent a lot of time understanding what good testing looks like, scientifically based good testing. But one of the things we, we start to talk a lot about at Decode is, is COVID the next chronic disease? Uh, is COVID going to drive more chronic disease? Is COVID going to create chronic disease that didn't exist before? And we can talk about that more, but COVID, you know, certainly Dr. Fauci, when you think about his background and, and Dr. Burks around the study of AIDS, I know Chase probably can weigh in on what that looks like compared to what we're looking at today. And, and you're talking of models. Uh, what, what type of, uh, you know, insights are you looking to do with AI? Like what type of predictions or classifications? Yeah, so we, um, we look on the chronic disease side at three risk buckets patients that are heading towards a diagnosis, patients that are misdiagnosed, and then patients that are about to experience an adverse event. And so we are focused primarily on giving care teams insights prior to those outcomes to be able to say, this patient is on, is on a certain path. You can either accelerate their time to diagnosis, you can help eliminate misdiagnosis, which in the case of some of these autoimmune diseases like MS, you know, could lead to tens of thousands of dollars in drugs being prescribed unnecessarily, uh, all the while symptoms aren't being managed. Um, and in that third risk bucket, doctors have often have to play security guard. They don't know when a patient's going to experience an adverse event. They don't necessarily know when treatment's going to fail until it's too late. And so being able to send up the flare before to say that, you know, Chase is on a path that isn't good, it could lead to a hospitalization. And the simple act of getting that patient back in front of their doctor can reduce the likelihood of hospitalizations. And if they do end up in the hospital, it can abbreviate that stay. And we've seen that play out not only in the data we've, we've examined, but in the data that others have examined too. So it kind of as an independent validation. Um, we're looking on, on a more technical side at both classification and regression problems, uh, time series based problems. We've developed our own time series methodology 
We've also played war games with the data robot team and, and, and done head to head analyses. And I'm going to tell you, it's a beautiful thing to be able to, um, have your own approach, but also have it be validated or reinforced by, um, a second approach. The other thing I think that is important to talk about here is feature impact and understanding um, explanations associated with predictions. And so that's an area that we've, we've been interested in for many years now. And um, I, 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 we were always not only looking at the list that ge that's generated at the the back end of, of a machine learning exercise, but what are the key ingredients in the recipe that went in to the process to lead to that result? And what could we learn about those, those features? And how could we address some of those features as underlying risk in populations? And, uh, you know, a couple thoughts, you know, you are, you know, starting out at the code uh, what, how do you decide to build, you know, versus buy a platform or tools to help you with that AI? One of the things that we've always factored into the mix is, you know, manpower. Um, it, there's, there's an old adage in research, people are cheap and equipment is expensive. And in startup land, people are expensive and equipment's cheap. And I think that for, for us, we look for tools that allow us to create efficiency in silico. And, in, and, and we always try to build patterns and processes that are replicable um, so that we can um, deliver custom solutions at scale and not have to have a lot of people hands on keyboard maintaining that, that infrastructure. And that's hard for people to realize because they are thinking of this in 2008, 2010 um, context where, gosh, you know, you must have, you know, 15, 20 SQL engineers and, you know, four, five, six senior data scientists. Well, you really don't have to have that because cloud computing's come a long way. And, um, you know, we have auto ML solutions like, like Data Robot that rough it in. Um, and then, you know, the data scientist job is really to take what the, what the data robot sous chef has produced and, you know, taste the soup at the end of the process, maybe add some seasoning to it, and then send it out the door. The, the IP and the, the meat of this is how you're amassing data, how you're asking questions, how you're structuring that data so that um, the commodity side of this, which is the, the auto ML side, can can do its job and um, get you to that end result. I'd also like to add that we say one size is not a good answer, but there are plenty of data analytics companies out there who have a national model for a disease without consideration of any of the geographic factors. So data robot and cloud computing have allowed us to really think about what is possible and looking at every possibility in one shot and doing it over minutes instead of days, which is just a tremendous advancement. Great. Thank you for that. So this podcast is called The More Intelligent Tomorrow. What type of innovations can we look forward to in five or 10 years? It could be in healthcare, it could be uh, outside or in general. Julia, you want to go, you want to go first or you want me to go first? Well, I mean, I know what we're doing. When I think five to 10 years, I don't know. I, I can't even imagine. You go first. I'll, well, I'll resolve that. Now I'm, I'm going to tell you what it's it's it's, it's I'm really excited because I, I've seen where we've come in five to ten years uh, to now, and I think the ability to tear through even larger data sets and the ability to tease out patterns from even more information, uh, not not to knock Data Robot, but we're, we even test some of the <laughs> upper limits of the Data Robot platform as it stands today, and we find that. A lot of the questions we would love to ask, we can't ask because they're, they can be co computationally intensive or, um, you know, the, um, the methods to string together the, the longitudinal records might um, create file sizes that are just un unwieldy. Um, so I would say that 
you know, I long for the day when we can have kind of a Tony Stark Jarvis interaction where we can take massive data sets and ask simple questions, transform and snap together very large data sets and then be able to look at patterns in, on, um, on an even larger scale. Quantum computing, I think, is something that everybody points to as, as a potential to unlock that computational might and strength in the future. Um, I think if, if we can continue asking questions that test the limits of the technology we've built, we'll continue to expand our knowledge and continue to push the horizons of, of, of discovery. And um, I want to be a part of that. And I know, you know, Julie and I both want to be a part of that. And we, we our fondest uh, memories, I think, at least for me, and she can speak for herself, but it, it's sitting around asking what if. And um, th that's that, that's the coolest part of this. Well, I think um, that that's something I was going to jump in and say. I think the growth in AI is first building trust in AI. And, you know, when we think about what we've been about from the minute we started iQuity, it's all about the power of being early, the power of an early insight that can drive an earlier diagnosis or an earlier intervention to prevent a, or mitigate an adverse event. And that the, the how did you do that question, which comes once you provide this insight, that's why we're so determined to provide context with our answers. But building the trust among providers, what we're trying to communicate is we're not trying to take over what you're doing. We're trying to make what you do easier. We're trying to give you insight so that you can re-engage with your patient because that's often the best thing that can happen. So from the very beginning, you know, early identification leads to better, uh, you know, an earlier treatment, which leads to better long-term outcomes. But AI that's a super big black box scares people. And I think we have to build trust in those using the outputs to believe in it. There's a great book called Weapons of Math Des Destruction uh, that a woman wrote about algorithms gone wrong. So some of this is a matter of having having to build a trust in the, the medical community. Yeah, let's go around with final thoughts. Um, Chase, anything else you wanted to say? No, I just really, really appreciate the opportunity to spend some time with the RA. You know, we value our partnership with, with Data Robot. And I think that, you know, the projects we're working on are complementary to where Data Robot is going in the future as well. And I think, you know, we have certainly viewed our partnership as a better together approach because a lot of the ideas that y'all are continuing to incubate internally, they truly complement our, our own. So it's, 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 been a, it's been a great partnership and love the fact that you guys are starting to put people here in, in Nashville and, you know, we're developing, continue to, to develop those friendships and look, look forward to continuing um, together in the years to come. Great. We appreciate it as well. And Julia, any final thoughts? Well, I think it's it, it it's terrific to have having watched um, companies evolve for almost thirty plus years now, uh, to have this kind of partnership with a company like Data Robot that can deliver technologies that we could never afford to build with the same number of people inside our business, and so one more way of leveraging some really smart people who are not only just providing a solution but are also available to us to answer questions when we run into problems using the tool or, or think about a vision for what it all could do. I mean, we were lucky enough to be part of uh, the group last year talking about all the different ways that the tools are used. And healthcare wasn't a big use case. So we're very proud to be part of the work uh, looking at healthcare opportunities and, and ways to use data robots um, solution. It, it, it makes being a startup a lot better if you don't have to hire an entire data science team and then build from scratch. And that's sort of where it would have been five years ago. So we're, we're very pleased to have the benefit of, of the work that everybody's done at Data Robot to get, to get us to this point. Well, we're very pleased to uh, help you be a part of you know, something great. I know I am wishing you all the best in, in success and helping people's lives as our many individuals, as well as really all of civilization. So thank you both so much for being on the podcast. Thank you. Thank you.